So I want to talk a little bit about morphing because I think that's what um, we are really seeing as probably the biggest issue that's happening in California and it has certainly uh, followed me to uh, San Luis Obispo. We want to talk about what that is, what are the origins of morphing, how did we get here, how did that happen as a result of state law, what's happening uh, in the overall entertainment and, uh, and restaurant business. Uh, a little bit of data, uh, uh, particularly in San Luis Obispo and statewide about uh, police events and alcohol license. Uh, the state uh, perspective uh, on uh, California ABC, uh, why local control is important and why local control in every jurisdiction that I've worked at has been essentially a required action because at this point relying upon the state resources just not, has not been adequate to deal with the problem. And then what we can do to work with our partners and businesses, uh, what are the industry uh, practices and operator experiences? And then how do we go from here and what are some of the next steps that San Luis Obispo is contemplating taking? So where do we go from here? This is a scene in, in uh, uh, San Luis Obispo. This is a, a, at, during the daytime. Uh, this is a, a restaurant. Um, and essentially at nighttime, it essentially converts to uh, a, um, a dance club, uh, to a nightclub and bar and pub. Um, this is uh, a, a, something that we see quite often in the, in the downtown. Essentially, as I mentioned, morphing is that shift. So where we see the operations such as the restaurant uh, become uh, primarily focused on alcohol uh, service. As we all know, there's various different types of alcohol licenses um, that the uh, state of California issues to uh, regulate alcohol. Uh, a, a, re a license uh, by the state allows for on sale uh, and is recognized as a, by local jurisdiction. Uh, and we recognize restaurant as a, as a specific land use. And we're, we allow it to serve alcohol incidental to meals during, during regular business hours. As of right. At, in, 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 the, in the city of, of San Luis Obispo, up until 11 o'clock, we allow it. And uh, so what is the, the, uh, the issue? Where when you've already got over concentrated uh, census tracts and bars and, and taverns, adding restaurants then, uh, then are mar that are morphing uh, pile on to that already existing uh, condition. We get crowds uh, impact to the, uh, to the community, the adjacent neighborhoods that surround the commercial districts uh, really tend to, to see it um, <laughs> on weekends um, and certainly on Tuesday nights with uh, Councilman Ashbaugh, we hear uh, stories about um, people coming to and from the bars, uh, people who are so inebriated that they end up walking into the wrong home, um, people who are so inebriated that uh, they leave gifts on people's front doors and in their landscaping, all very unpleasant things that I think was part of the narrative and part of the story that helped catalyze and, re and, and <coughs> develop the resolve with the council about changing public policy. And, and like you, we've had a real problem with binge drinking uh, and with a couple of alcohol-related deaths, too, of Cal Poly students. So that really catalyzes a lot of public opinion, remarkably. So again, a not too unfamiliar scene. Uh, we have, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the data in, in San Luis Obispo, which is really one of the drivers that I think told the story about what was happening. So just a, a couple uh, ads uh, that you see, and these are probably, n again, not unusual. Um, drink specials, um, a lot of marketing material to uh, uh, college students uh, who are sometimes their first time away from to um, home, who don't have a lot of experience uh, managing alcohol consumption. And um, these are certainly very attractive uh, to them. And the, and the bars and restaurants do a really good job of marketing them and getting, getting them to come out on Thursdays, uh, Fridays, and Saturday night. So, uh, oh, am I going backwards? Uh, in, in terms of how did we get here, the evolving community, we have, the, I talked about the shifting norms uh, for eating and dining, uh, new opportunities. You've seen, I think, a big transition from the mom and pop chains uh, in, your, in your downtown to more of the, to the uh, retail chains. Increased mobility, encouraging tourism. Uh, uh, like San Diego County, San Luis Obispo, attracts a fair amount of tourists that come down. They want to have a great time. 
and the restaurants and bars um, offer that um, experience. Um, one of the other trends we're seeing in, in probably in your downtown as, you, as your towns start to think about land use and infill projects, we're doing, res, we're doing uh, residential projects in our downtown. And that, um, that mix of restaurant bars is creating inherent conflicts with uh, mi mixed use. And um, social media in, in particular is, is we're seeing also as a very big way that um, bars are bringing in crowds to, to the retail districts. And of course, we as, as cities, you know, we like to we want to have vibrant downtowns. We want to have good entertainment districts. We want to see that happen. And so we're encouraging the, the redevelopment and, and the placement of these restaurants and, and bars in the downtown. But as, we, as we've seen in the downtowns, you know, these restaurants and bars are essentially driving the market of what uh, um, landlords are seeing for a return on their, on their property. And as such, we're starting to see these restaurants and bars start to displace uh, uh, retailers and start to change the overall dynamic in the downtown where we see certain blocks that are essentially dead during the daytime. At nighttime, they, they wake up and that's when the neighbors really start to uh, experience issues. Yeah, our retailers especially are concerned about this because uh, not only do they uh, hear about from, from customers, hey, this is the last time I'm coming downtown, I had to step over, you know, inebriates and that sort of thing. We, uh, like many of your cities, also have a problem with homeless or transient individuals, and I, I emphasize or because most of our homeless actually are, uh, they became homeless in San Luis Obispo. We just have some numbers on that we're releasing today, in fact, about 70%. But that's another issue. And uh, uh, it's clearly, a, it, it, we, we still do have a vibrant retail uh, daytime community throughout most of the downtown, but the danger is that at a certain point, you, have, you pass a, a tipping point, most of your street frontage is devoted to restaurants and bars, and, uh, and, and what you, where you used to be able to go down in town and, and buy at least maybe some high-end boutique clothing, shoes. Uh, we have one sock, uh, sock shop. So it's nothing but socks in downtown San Luis, and those places uh, help to add to the real flavor and mix of downtown San Luis Obispo. So talking a little bit about the framework for uh, local control, uh, uh, of course, we're all familiar with ABC and their general licensing uh, authority and their state law. Um, ABC will tell you, and because they're very under-resourced, I think they have the same amount of enforcement officers I think I've been told that they had in, in the 1960s. And I believe that uh, we have two or four um, ABC officers for Ventura, Santa Barbara, and San Luis Obispo County. So they have basically told us from the beginning, we do not have the resources to do the enforcement that's necessary in the oversight for alcohol establishments. If you want to have effective oversight, you need to use your local land use authority to then, and then give your, uh, your police powers and use your law enforcement, your code enforcement as a mechanism to properly manage your, uh, your entertainment and restaurant uh, districts. And so there is that provision under uh, state law, under land use law, and, uh, and uh, we've adopted um, various different provisions in our municipal code, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, one of those is, uh, is a deemed approved ordinance, which is essentially applying standards to existing operating uh, bars, taverns, restaurants. Basically, it sets performance standards for those existing establishments that were not permitted uh, through a use permit process. We have bars in the downtown that have been in existence for 85 years. Uh, uh, Councilman Ashbaugh uh, mentioned we've been a city since uh, 1852. Uh, we were a railway city. Uh, we were, we've been a university town for over a hundred years. Uh, we had, an, uh, had a, seen a huge influx of um, uh, military uh, personnel that came through uh, preparing for the Pacific Theater in for, uh, at um, Camp Roberts and in Fort Ord. So alcohol has been a part of the, the, the fabric of San Luis Obispo for a number of years. It's not, not unique. Beyond that, we have a lot of cowboys and, and rangeland that surrounds San Luis Obispo. So there is just an exciting mix of, of people that come into the town to, to enjoy themselves for over 150 years, and that continues today. Notable that one of our bars is called Mustang Tavern. Cal Poly Mustangs. Go Mustangs. 
So, I've um, so the other tool is, and I'll get into that greater, is the conditional use permit process. And we apply that to all bars, taverns, and to restaurants who want to serve alcohol after 11 p.m. Um, we do have, as a permitted use, as of right, in our commercial districts, if you're a restaurant and you want to serve alcohol till 11 o'clock, you can essentially do that with a, a building permit, and you don't need to go through a, a, a use per, uh, process. All these are really the tools for, whoops, um, trying to find the binder here, for the, for the prevention oversight. And I, and I should say that um, part of, you know, this is just one piece of that the, the city is using. These are our police powers, but we've also partnered with um, Cal Poly and our local Cuesta College on creating a civility group around creating the culture in San Luis Obispo. Um, and we've, we have now just embarked on a whole campaign. The great thing about having half of your population in your town that turns over every four years is that you do have the ability to essentially reset culture um, if you make a very concerted effort in, in doing so. So how do we know that morphine is a problem? We've, we can talk about it a little bit from the ABC license enforcement data. Uh, local communities, and I'll talk about uh, selected police events in and around uh, um, San Luis Obispo. Uh, we've, we've heard that, I've talked a little bit about that on public comments, hearings, constituent complaints, and community discussion, uh, and an analysis of local police data. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about our ACIPS GIS uh, process where we essentially went out and mapped and associated alcohol events with certain establishments to show and, and dispute some of the anecdotal data about what was the root cause of the problem. So in terms of uh, statewide data, looking at 2012, we've got 43,000 licenses in the state of California. You can see uh, the bulk of those, uh, roughly about uh, 37,000 of those are on-sale beer and wine restaurants or on-sale general restaurants. So the bulk of licenses that we're seeing in, in the state of California are trending in that uh, particular direction. They're less expensive to, to obtain. They're not subject to the over-concentration and the public convenience and necessity requirements under the law. So as a result of that, those are the type that are pro uh, proliferating. As I mentioned, just our eating trends in society as people are looking for, for that nighttime or that, that dining out experience, it's, it's a very attractive market. How does that compare to the, uh, the city of uh, San Luis uh, Obispo? Um, we do, you can see we, our beer and uh, wine licenses in the downtown uh, and general restaurants. They're the predominant number of, of licenses that we have, um, totaling 83. And this is where we start to get into to some of the data out of our, out of our study. Uh, we can see that uh, back in 2008, uh, we had um, 869 alcohol or other drug events um, in the downtown. Uh, the, um, the majority of those, uh, again, were associated with beer, and, uh, with, with restaurants, uh, and the rest correlate to uh, those uh, uh, restaurants as well. But, but I think, I, I do think what you find from, from, this, uh, from this is a, a disproportionate effect of the, this, this is bars, bars and taverns. And uh, so we only have five of them, but 93 AOD event, events as opposed to um, you know, just a few more for 24 restaurants. It's a disproportionate impact of, of bars and taverns, but restaurants are getting up there as well. So this is some of the work that we embarked on um, to essentially look at and try to correlate the, the data between those establishments and those alcohol and other drug events. And what you're seeing on the screen here is a map of the city of San Luis uh, Obispo. Uh, the downtown is essentially on uh, this core here, uh, we've, and the blue dots essentially indicate those particular uh, locations. Um, so, and you, we have in these particular census tracts, this is where we're, we're over-concentrated today uh, for, uh, for those bars and taverns. Uh, what, what, what did the data also tell us? It told us a little bit more about the story about what's happening in, in the city of San Luis Obispo. It told us that where are our problem times? We can see that our problem times are essentially beginning at uh, 10 o'clock at night until about 2 in the morning. Uh, we can see that it really starts to spike up. The restaurants 
uh, are converting to nightclubs. The, the nightclubs and bars are in full swing, and that's where we st uh, start to see a tremendous amount of uh, police activity and associated arrests. So the factors contributing to, uh, to, to morphine, um, again, looking for that, that experience. We did essentially uh, this study and correlated it to, um, to our establishments. That was all done in, in concert with the community. We did a tremendous amount of outreach with neighborhood groups uh, that participated in helping um, our consultant understand and tell the story about what's happening in their particular neighborhood. Um, we uh, developed an overall uh, public safety uh, night, uh, nightlife assessment, and that provided to the city council a whole range of options. We now were understanding the problem, what were the problem establishments, what were the dynamics that were occurring, where, wh what time was it occurring, now what can we do about it, and out of that came this public safety assessment. And then from there began a series of city council hearings and then specific direction to staff including uh, my department, the Community Development Department, the Police Department, and other people that had a role in public safety. And all along the way, we were very, very engaged with uh, the public. And I use that very broadly, meaning the neighborhood groups, and in particular, the downtown association that had a very vested interest. When this process began with the downtown association, there was a tremendous amount of resistance. When this public safety report and this data came, came out, it, the, the message from the downtown association is we can regulate ourselves. We don't need government to step in. Let us figure this out. And, um, the, and council, after hearing um, some input, decided to uh, give it a try and sent staff out to do some outreach with the downtown association when, and business groups and neighborhoods and figure something out. In the, in the long run, what we ended up coming up, in, coming up with was the solutions that I've mentioned. The uh, permit conditions, we now have very uh, stringent permit conditions that are associated with our, our use permits for restaurants articulating about lines, uh, training for people who are serving alcohol, uh, uh, security uh, personnel related to occupancy, um, video equipment. Um, we have shopped around the state and found, I think, a collection of some best practices about conditions that should be associated with uh, use permits for restaurants and bars. And we also came up with a new uh, uh, definition for restaura uh, restaurants, and then, uh, as I'll talk about, we regulated those in a particular manner, and then the deemed approved ordinance. Uh, I've talked a little bit about this, about restaurant licenses being easier to obtain, not, subje not subject to the concentration uh, restrictions under state law, and um, uh, the uh, limited opportunities to request uh, conditions or to implement conditions. This was before we uh, enacted uh, the regulations. And ABC definitions uh, regarding restaurants were a little outdated and difficult to enforce. Uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with the, essentially the 50% plus one that ABC uses for restaurants where they're supposed to look at that as food being the primary source of uh, revenue. Well, as I mentioned, the resources that they have, they don't really have uh, the resources available to, to monitor that in a, in a really meaningful way. And again, we've seen the, the alcohol culture change. So, in, so just to tell and shift now to the story of, and, uh, of what happened at the city council, uh, we engaged the services of Clue Associates, uh, who are experts in alcohol policy from uh, Berkeley. Uh, they uh, presented a report to staff, which eventually made its way to City Council in October of 2009. It's an alcohol, drug, and sensitive information planning uh, report. Uh, it's that essentially the, uh, and Councilman Ashbaugh's got a copy of the report uh, that showed uh, extensively the data and the correlation between alcohol and other drug events. It was a very well-prepared public policy piece that was very objective in nature, just told the facts about what was happening in the community. Out, uh, all, out of that, a lot of that was being driven by uh, you know, the alcohol binge drinking. We had a, we had a couple deaths of Cal Poly students. Um, and the city council held this study session 
and we received the report and again it, it documented the extensive nature of these events. And the morphine too. So what did the findings show? 60% of the events and 50% uh, uh, of the AOD arrests occur between 10 and 2 o'clock in the morning. 65% of the arrests in the downtown uh, are AOD related versus 56% for the rest of the city. So it was a clear correlation between alcohol serving establishments. Um, out of the 114 outlets in the downtown, 10 were, were the real problem children that were accounting for the, almost half of the calls. So we could really start to see where we needed to focus our, our limited resources on what were the problem sites. Places to avoid if you wanted to go dining in San Luis Obispo. And out of these 10, five were restaurants. So we really started to see, wait a minute, what's happening here? We were, these are not bars. That's not, t you know, and people were, when we were hearing uh, uh, input at Kid City Council meetings, it was, it's bars, bars, bars. Well, we finally figured out, no, it's part of the issue is response. And one was a brew pub and there was more detail. And, and out of that, um, the City Council ordered uh, my department, the uh, police department, to recommend and come up with strategies for enhanced oversight of these outlets. So we came back in November of 2010. Uh, we launched a, a nighttime public safety assessment. Uh, we agreed to work jointly with, uh, on various different ex efforts, both uh, enforcement by our police department. Our police department now, uh, at nighttime, the, uh, the uh, patrol that works at downtown, they have a binder with them that has every single use permit in them. So they can pull open the binder at nighttime and look at, well, what are the use permit requirements for this particular location? Uh, would so it be an Android app? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also got um, the slow ho the hospitality community res or organized a response, and we obtained a grant from the Responsible Hospitality Institute to do some work, and we organized a series of meetings with uh, businesses in the communities to develop and recommend policies, and the city council reviewed uh, that report from. Uh, the responsible from RHI and then directed further oversight and development of specific policies. We came back a year later with what our, rec what our approach was going to be. Uh, they confirmed that, the, that they were still committed to this. Um, the, the now at this point, uh, we heard a little bit about what the industry was doing. The, as I started early on when the report came out, there was a fair, fair amount of negative reaction from, whoops, from the bars, and they had implemented a few different programs. One was a safe uh, ride program, uh, a downtown cleanup, cleaning up the downtown uh, on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights, um, adding porta, -pot porta potties during uh, uh, high traffic um, uh, uh, dates and months, um, implementing lead trading for all of their uh, servers, irregardless of it, whether it was a requirement under the use permit. And they came up with what we thought was a pretty innovative plan, which was 186 all 86. So if you were uh, a bad actor in one of the bars that night, you'd get your photo taken. And they had a little list that they would send it around to all the other different uh, door people and security. And then, you, you know, if you were trying to, they would monitor that. And if you tried to go into the next bar down the road, they'd say, sorry, and we understand that you've been a problem child down the street and you're not welcome. And so that was uh, something that they've implemented. And they've also been very, very proactive in, in uh, getting the word out about responsible uh, marketing uh, campaign. This is where really a, a shift began to take place within the, uh, the outlet owners themselves. They actually hired a recently retired San Luis Obispo police captain and I think between Steve Tolley and us as individual council members and our staff, uh, we got the message to them. And they really stepped up and took on these responsibilities. Now, I will have to say that with respect to the 186, all 86, that may be a little bit problematic. They've, they've mentioned to us that there are some uh, privacy issues, problems with that. They, they, they have, uh, I don't know if they've been sued on that basis yet or not, but they're fearful they might be. So. Uh, we have to be a little bit um, wary about, about promoting that as uh, something your, your alcohol outlet community might be able to do. Uh, but they could call our people and they could fill you in on that. 
But, but I do want to say that having someone from law enforcement, a retired law enforcement person working with them, gave them the perspective. And I think that uh, uh, the downtown bar and rest restaurant operators understood that they had a huge role to play, that just simply regulation and enforcement wasn't going to be the answer. And, and all of them, at least the good operators, they wanted to have an elevated and, and good experience for their patients. They didn't want to see the type of uh, negative um, things happening in their downtown, and they wanted to stop as well, and so they, they took this action. Just a quick preview, the last slide we have here is the benefits of this regulatory program to those owners. So we'll, we'll get to that. So this came back in, in November of 2011. Uh, they rev revised the zoning definitions to address future al alcohol outlets and the morphing of restaurants and bars. They required use permit process for future alcohol outlets. And they uh, developed a deemed approved ordinance for existing alcohol outlets. And this was uh, modeled after um, the city of Oakland. The city of Oakland had a deemed approved ordinance and it had been court tested with the uh, appellate's court here in California. And it was a, an ordinance that our city attorney thought was a great model, seeing that it had withstood that test, that's something we should use. Uh, the use permit were required for all new bars, nightclubs. Um, uh, we also required use permits for restaurant serving alcohol after 11 o'clock, late night alcohol service. In that particular instance, what we did is we, if you wanted to serve alcohol after 11 o'clock if you're a restaurant, the conditions that we would typically include is you can't move the tables and chairs. You can't essentially become a nightclub after 11 o'clock. You had, if you were going to serve alcohol, you still had to provide full menu service. Uh, you had to do all the other things that bars had to do in terms of, of conditions. And these things really strengthened, uh, at least from our perspective, the ability to keep them from morphing. And then we had modified enhanced standards, noise standards, limits on alcohol serving hours, manager on site, a security plan, lead training, um, et cetera, et cetera. These are, you know, and we're happy to provide this information to Eric and Anthony so we can make it available to you. And then, of course, we had better coordination with our police department and ABC. Uh, we actually are doing now, we'll, we'll send out letters to restaurants and bar operators and say, hey, we're coming through in the next couple of weeks. We're going to be checking in, in on your use uh, permit conditions. We'll be around between you know, anywhere from 6 o'clock at night till 2 o'clock in the morning. And I'm happy to say, as we reported to the city council this summer, that we saw very little violations. We actually had only two notice of violations that went out to uh, operators in our downtown. So how does the uh, a deemed approved ordinance work? It applies to existing outlets without use permits. That bar that's been around since the day after prohibition, uh, that's that's there. That you know is the is the watering hole that you know grandfather, son, and now Cal Poly student have gone to for eons, <laughs> and is a rowdy place with you know rowdy folks. Um, we set these general performance standards and uh, to regulate nuisance and criminal behavior. And so we've set some objective standards by which, if there are there criminal activity, we can build a body of evidence and then bring it forward in front of a hearing officer and essentially revoke that use if need be. Uh, the, again, based upon that City of Oakland ordinance uh, upheld by the appellate court. And then uh, what is probably most unique about this is it established a procedure to include the downtown association before going to the hearing officer. So I want to talk a Can you speak to that? I think that probably would resonate the most with this audience. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit now. So how does this work? So we get a complaint received. Uh, let's say we have a patron or a law enforcement officer or, uh, or somebody says, you know, this we've seen now criminal activity or uh, something that is happening at, at an existing establishment with, with or without a use uh, uh, permit that's violating the municipal code. Uh, once we go out and ver verify that complaint, um, there is an, uh, we've written into our municipal code uh, a way to go and meet with the Safe, Night Safe Nightlife Association or the Downtown Association. So they don't have any sort of a judicatory role uh, in the process, but they do have a role in um, trying to work with that operator to come up with, well, how can we help you solve your problem? How can we help this not become a problem in front of the hearing officer? 
Um, and so it's a, it's a way to kind of mediate the issue with the local businesses and the city. Uh, it doesn't prevent the, the, the actual case from being brought forward to the administrative hearing officer. The city council was very clear uh, with staff that if a complaint is verified, um, this optional step, if, if at the end we come up with a resolution, they still want to have uh, something uh, submitted to a hearing officer and something submitted into the record. And we also, in the ordinance, we designate uh, an alcohol outlet manager uh, for these hearings within the community development department, one of, one of Derek's employees. And then eventually, if, depending on the outcome, if, it's, if the use permit or the existing use that's is, is uh, revoked. You can appeal that to the Planning Commission and then if need be uh, appeal that all the way to the City Council and if you're not happy there you can find your way to su Superior Court. Yeah. We hope not. <laughs> so the benefits of the downtown regulations, we've seen this firsthand. Um, improved public safety in the downtown. Uh, we, uh, in, in the last um, year, we've added two more uh, law, uh, police officers in the downtown. Uh, to primarily deal with uh, transient homeless issues, but to also just deal with related alcohol and drug issues. Uh, we've, with new expanded um, levels of enforcement, we've seen about the same number of arrests and activities. But in talking to our police chief and the captain who oversees operations, they've largely attributed that with just greater enforcement, not with elevated activity. So we think actually the activity has gone down in our, in our downtown. Uh, we uh, are seeing an, a reduced number of alcohol incidents and police responses to some extent. Um, we've seen just, and this has probably been, I think, one of the cornerstones of our success and I think a real testament to the community collaboration, and which is, I think, at the heart of the, the city's approach to developing this policy is great collaboration with the downtown businesses. This has really strengthened our relationships with them, and we've really found that common goal. Uh, both between city staff, the community, and particularly our elected uh, representatives. And we've uh, really, uh, you know, strived to find that balance between regulations and maintaining a vibrant downtown center. We didn't want these regulations to become a barrier to uh, ongoing revitalization in, in slow. So since the adoption, we've, we've actually had no violations of the deemed approved ordinance. The violations I talked about have been for existing use permits. Um, we've actually had a relocation of a large uh, nightclub brewery in the downtown, which was, uh, um, was appealed all the way to the city council, but the city council felt they had the confidence that the programs and the policies we had developed could carefully manage the dynamics. Um, in use permits for late night hour, uh, late hour alcohol services, we've had three approved, um, two were withdrawn because they saw the standards that would be associated with and that we weren't going to allow them to morph, that that wasn't a business model that they wanted to pursue. And though even with that, we still, we just recently did a citywide survey and alcohol out issues remains one of the primary issues in the downtown. And we're currently in the process of updating our general plan. And so we're, we're working with our consultant in the community on what other tools might we pursue. So what can you take uh, as a city and a leader in your community? Uh, communicate early on what the, exp uh, what the expectations are of operators. Uh, document the, uh, the use permit conditions, provide the oversight, increase enforcement of, of over-serving establishments. And we should make sure that uh, applicants fully understand uh, their responsibility. Uh, make sure that the managers walk them through the use permits, walk the, operate, the owner through the use permit uh, requirements, provide them with those standards, post them, and under, understand what, that they, make sure that they understand what their responsibilities are to monitor drinking on site. It looks like I'm getting and, a hook and that here. The city will monitor as well. We're we're not just going to issue the permit and then walk away and let them morph. <laughs> Continue to morph. And this is my last slide here. A little bit about the benefits to uh, your community: safer environments, the public, reduce resources for law enforcement, and resources that are uh, then de uh, had, that have to be dedicated dis to disorderly businesses. I think one thing that would really resonate uh, with the group as well is your city's look at Proposition 26 
and potential fee structures in the future, or how uh, that may be a stumbling block with your community. Uh, so if you could speak to that, would be great. Sure, happy to do that. I, I saw, uh, I don't know if everyone heard the question, but the question was uh, Prop 26 and the relationship to any sort of fees that used to administer programs like that. And the, the city council early on made a deliberate policy decision that they did not want to use fees to fund this. Um, we're going to be revisiting that as part of our next effort. Um, um, and so there is a lot of resources, both code enforcement and law, and law enforcement, that's, uh, that goes into uh, implementing and reviewing these conditional use permit uh, uh, programs. And to that extent, we're going to be looking at whether or not fees is a way to, to recover part or uh, all of the costs um, for, these, um, for these enforcement efforts. I think we have one more slide. Oh, yeah, this is the, the last one I want to just uh, point out to you is that uh, we do think that there is a fair, a fair amount of benefits to operators, and they've, they've told us this firsthand. Um, the customers uh, enjoy the experience better when there's not inebriated people uh, in and, and around their establishment, reduce the, the risk to their staff being involved in fights, um, you know, customers walking in and out, um, uh, saving our workers comp. We had one of our businesses t told us that, uh, that their insurance experts suggested that 99% of their claims was a result of someone who was overserved. Yes. Uh, and then, of course, increase longevity to the business, minimize those losses, and then, of course, having good relations with the city and your neighbors is very, very important.